I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight, thank the people um, who are with us online. We are starting to inch towards moving away from a hybrid mode and back towards an in-person mode, so I thank everyone who came here this evening. Um, how many high school students do we have in the audience? Maybe a few? Welcome, we're so glad to have you. <laughs> um, so pre-pandemic, go back and tell all your friends because we have snacks. Um, Pre-pandemic, um, as we started this series, uh, in the year before we went into lockdown, some of you here can attest, we would routinely have 120, 160 people in this room for our lectures. In fact, at the end, like the last couple of lectures before we went into lockdown, we were breaking fire code in this room um, for our monthly lectures, which was just really fun. So as a speaker, it's so much more enjoyable to be able to engage with the audience. And honestly, high school students were the best parts of that. So there was a lot of prep in some cases for people taking AP Bio or Chem. Um, my daughter is in high school right now. She has AP Psych and AP Bio, and they cover the brain at an astonishing level of detail. I've been really impressed. Um, and the students would come and ask questions and make this fantastic dynamic audience. And uh, for those of you who don't know, if you're at the university, you generally kind of like to teach stuff. So that's really fun for us. Um, so please don't hesitate to ask questions and engage with our speakers tonight. Um, and I invite you all to pay attention. We'll be um, coming back with our next series, our continuing series for 22-23 um, shortly, starting with lectures again probably in February, March, April, May of next year. So we'll be reaching out on that. Um, Tonight, however, in terms of format, what we're going to do is hold questions all the way until the end, I think, because it's difficult to transition between speakers and take questions when we're also moderating online. So think about those questions that you have for our first speaker, hold those in your brain, and um, we'll come back to them towards the end. With that, I'm just going to stop there this evening. Again, thank you very much for attending and introduce um, ever so briefly our, our two speakers. We're really... Um, grateful to have here today because it's the middle of one of the big Society for Neuroscience conferences is going on right now, um, Dr. Al Espada and Dr. Ed Minuki, who are going to be speaking this evening. Al Espada um, was recruited here and was a huge catch for UCI, where he's um, launching a new center for neurotherapeutics, and we've been really pleased um, to be able to interact with him, um, particularly in the stem cell center because of the types of models that he uses to um, test screening drugs and moving things through to translation. And Dr. Ed Minuki is a longtime colleague who we've had at UCI for some time. Not only is he the chair of pathology here at UCI, but he also plays a really integral role in our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and, of course, here in the Stem Cell Research Center. So with that, I'm just going to thank them and ask Dr. Lospada to come up and begin his presentation. Thank you so much for the invitation to do this community lecture. Um, and. Uh, as Eileen explained, I'm going to be handing the baton off to Ed Manuki, who's my chair. So if I run long, I'll, I'll be in trouble. So I'll have to try and <clears throat> really keep to the time. So the way we've decided to do this is I'm going in and I'm going to just um, provide some observations in terms of um, um, some of the challenges that we face in terms of neurological diseases and a really a threat that is facing our society as our population ages and the challenges that we're trying to overcome in terms of coming up with ways for people to keep their brains healthy. Um, we have some ideas about how you can do that through lifestyle and then some discussion about, you know, how we're trying to develop therapies. So uh, what I'm going to point out, and I think everyone is going to agree with this, is the human brain is really magnificent. Um, it's the product of uh, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of years of, of evolution and um, allows us to be the incredibly complex, uh, creative, and for the most part, wonderful beings that we are. Um, and, you know, of course, I think the most important thing to emphasize is the brain is responsible for all the functions that make us truly human. The ability to think, communicate, move, walk, run, bike, play music. Well, the list goes on and on. So when you have a problem with the function of your brain, it's really devastating in terms of um, your ability to, you know, to, um, to really um, have a meaningful life. Yeah, so that's why neurological diseases are so devastating. And um, something that I've been interested in for a long time 
and that I want to sort of um, introduce to you in case you're not already aware of it is we have an aging population. Um, more people over 60 now fractionally than ever in the history of our country. This also applies um, to Western Europe as well. And so we face this threat of suffering from what is called a neurodegenerative disease. And um, neurodegenerative diseases actually affect over 7 million Americans today. And I think some of these diseases all of you will have heard of. In fact, it's very likely that you may have had a family member affected by one of them or a close friend. So um, Parkinson's disease, and um, I have an emblematic individual affected with each disease um, to go along with it, Michael J. Fox, of course, for Parkinson's disease. Alzheimer's disease has affected many people. Here I'm showing Ronald Reagan. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, of course I show Lou Gehrig because this is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease you know, the great um, baseball player um, for the New York Yankees. And then Huntington's disease, and the notable individual affected by this disease was, you know, Woody Guthrie, who wrote, um, you know, this land is, is our land, the, a folk singer. So neurodegenerative disorders, what are they? They are disorders where there's a progressive loss of selected neurons in specific brain regions, and that results in physical manifestations, such as problems with the ability to control your movement or, or to engage in you know, directed movement and or cognitive dysfunction, so the ability to think, to plan. Um, so this is a really serious problem because um, we, these disorders remain for the most part um, virtually untreatable um, uh, in our country and in the world. Now, um, so in terms of you know, what the reason is that we get these diseases. Well, it turns out that we've learned over the last um, two and a half decades that these diseases result from proteins that misfold and cannot be turned over, recycled. So again, you know, if you remember your high school or college biology, we all have genes, the genes become transcribed into RNA and the RNA gets encoded into proteins. We make proteins and then they serve a certain function. And um, when they get sort of damaged and beaten up in the process of fulfilling that function, and then what the cell wisely does is it directs them to, uh, um, to be broken down and uh, into their component parts so those component parts, the amino acids, can be recycled to make new proteins. So proteins should turn over. But what happens in neurodegenerative diseases is because the proteins misfold, they can't be degraded they accumulate in cells and they form what are called aggregates or inclusions. And here's some examples um, from you know, work that was done really at the turn of the last century where they were described by leading sort of scientists, neuropathologists like Dr. Louie and Dr. Pick, um, uh, where they described these you know, um, accumulations uh, of material that when you looked in the brains of deceased patients who suffered from neurodegenerative diseases, you found them there. And that was the first inkling, you know, that something was going wrong in terms of these protonaceous accumulations. And so these are what we believe is involved in leading to the demise of nerve cells in neurodegenerative disorders. And in fact, um, you know, it's become clear that all these different neurodegenerative diseases involve these proteins that misfold. And so Huntington's disease, there's the protein Huntington and it forms aggregates that end up in the nucleus of cells. And Alzheimer's disease, which everyone has heard about, involves, um, thank you, neurofibrillary tangles of tau and um, beta amyloid plaques. Parkinson's disease has Lewy bodies that consist of a protein called alpha-synuclein. In ALS, there's a particular protein, TDP43, that accumulates in motor neurons in the brain and the spinal cord. And then there's Jakob Kreutzfeld disease, a prion disease. It's super rare, but actually, to be perfectly honest, I have a close friend from Philadelphia who contacted me a few weeks ago because a friend of his um, started to lose the ability to talk and to think, and she was diagnosed with Jakob Kreutzfeld disease, and she just died yesterday from this disease. It just took three and a half weeks to take her. Um, it's exceedingly rare. Only one in 10 million people get that disease. But again, it involves uh, prions, which are these misfolded proteins. Um, so 
This is something we figured out that all neurodegenerative diseases involve proteins that misfold. And that's something that's driving um, the way we're approaching developing therapies to treat these diseases. So the goal of our research, um, many people's research, is to come up with ways to rid nerve cells of the toxic misfolded proteins that are leading to neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, Huntington's disease, and many other related disorders. So how are we trying to do that? Well, lots of ways. Um, and one thing, of course, is that when we do our research, we want to study patients who have these neurological diseases. We want to study what's going on in their brains. But um, we can't just take a blood sample to get nerve cells. And um, it's not ethical or moral to get a brain biopsy for research purposes. Uh, of course, when patients die from these diseases, um, we can collect their brain tissues. And that's helpful. But it's the very endpoint of the disease. So by then, you know, the main things that drove the disease process perhaps are over, and you really can't get a snapshot of what was responsible for causing the disease. So a very powerful approach that uh, we've taken and that's being pursued in this very building, where those of you who are attending in person uh, are sitting, is um, to use the power of stem cell research. And so we our patients, we collect a skin biopsy, or we could do a blood draw. And then what we do is we use an approach that was developed now over 15 years ago, where we re reprogram these cells into what are called induced pluripotent stem cells. And that means, because they're pluripotent, that means they have the ability to become any cell we want. And we have ways of making all these different cells. And you see, of course, the neurons are there. So we can make neurons, um, and we use those neurons to develop models to study these different diseases. And that's what we do here um, at the Sue and Bill Gross um, Center for Stem Cell Research. OK. So by creating these models of human neurodegenerative diseases using patient stem cells, we can identify the cellular processes that keep neurons healthy and happy with the intention of boosting these specific targets and pathways. You see, the reason why people get neurodegenerative diseases when they're older is that um, we have pathways that keep our neurons healthy and happy, um, but those pathways start to decline in function as we age. So one approach that we're taking is to identify those pathways and come up with ways to boost their function. And some pathways that are important here I've highlighted Oh, and one other thing I want to point out um, that is when we think about neurodegenerative diseases is how neurons are really unique. They're very specialized cells and they have unique challenges, incredibly high energy needs. So as you sit here in this room, over 65% of your energy is being expended um, above your neck. Um, your brain requires incredible amounts of energy just to do all the things that it does. And the other problem that um, neurons and nerve cells face is they actually have an Achilles heel in terms of dealing with turning over proteins. And I told you at the outset, the reason why we get neurodegenerative diseases is, you know, proteins are not being handled properly. And it turns out, for reasons we don't fully understand, that neurons are exquisitely vulnerable to keeping their proteins in a state of what we call high quality control. Um, okay, so with this information that we've learned um, from decades and decades of research and using these models, you know, we come up with like sort of processes that we think are important. And so, and these lead to possible targets. So one thing that actually we're doing in my own lab is we're trying to come up with ways to increase energy. And there's an organelle called the mitochondria that's responsible for most of our energy production and also to boost protein quality control and we've come up with a few targets, um, PGC1-alpha, and activators are being designed by a structural biology approach. PPAR-delta, we, we already have an agonist for that. It's in preclinical trials. It's actually moved into clinical trials to treat Alzheimer's disease, and we're hoping to move it now into a clinical trial for Huntington's disease, and a protein called RXR. And again, there's a promising agonist in preclinical trials. By preclinical, I mean these are studies that we do in animals, typically in mice. So the research allows us to identify specific targets, and then we try and 
design drugs that in this case will increase the function of these targets. Um, another pathway that's really important is the ubiquitin proteasome system. This is sort of like one of the um, garbage disposals of the cell and neuron. So I told you when proteins get beaten up, they get degraded. Well, this is one way they get degraded. And you can see how they get broken down into their component amino acids, and then you can make new proteins. So this is one of the main pathways for protein degradation in humans, in multicellular organisms and it allows for selective and dynamic removal of individual proteins or groups of proteins. So we're trying to come up with ways to promote the function uh, of this sort of turnover pathway in the nervous system. And another pathway, and this is really complicated, I apologize, <laughs> but I love this pathway. It's called autophagy. It's, to me, the single most important cellular process um, known to, um, to mammals. <laughs> And uh, it's been around forever. I mean, yeast, you know, the one-celled organisms known as yeast that you may use when you bake bread um, sort of have it. And uh, it's the major pathway by which um, not just proteins are degraded, but also these things called organelles because they get beaten up over time and they need to be degraded. Um, it, it requires the function of an organelle known as the lysosome, um, which is sort of... Uh, uh, an organelle that has the ability to degrade things because it has a very low acidic um, pH where you know you can sort of digest things the way your stomach digests things but here on the level of this little sort of structure within a cell and um, autophagy has been adapted in us to carry out very different functions in different cell types and I won't go into the research, but we've figured out as a field that it's very, very important in nerve cells. And so a lot of effort has gone into coming up with ways to um, regulate it and activate it. So this is another sort of pathway that's important for central nervous system function. And then the last um, thing I want to get into, and this ties into the fluid part, is the so-called um, glymphatic system. And it's one of these things that, to me, always fascinates me, um, that um, people had thought about it existing. In fact, there was a famous anatomist, Virchow, many centuries ago, who thought it existed. But it wasn't until just 10 years ago that scientists proposed that it exists, and then they demonstrated its, its, its existence. So what it is is it's a drainage system in the brain. So we have a lymphatic system in our body for drainage, you know, um, that runs through our body, and there's a similar system just for the brain. And this um, fluid-mediated clearance system for the brain, it turns out to be a major route for the elimination of toxic substances and misfolded neurodegenerative disease causing proteins. And um, one thing that we've learned, and, and this is really, really interesting and really important, is one of the key determinants for the maximal, maximal function of this system is sleep. This system operates while we're sleeping. And one reason we think that people are more likely to get neurodegenerative diseases when they get older is their sleep patterns uh, are broken, broken up, and so this pathway doesn't work as well. Um, and so now that's an important thing to know because right away it tells us there's one thing that we can do to sort of keep our brains happy and healthy, and that is to get a good night's sleep and to really um, try and work on that. Um, so, again, this system is, uh, works in a way where, you know, fluid comes up and goes through the brain and then it ends up sort of draining. And, and again, I don't want to go into the, <clears throat> into the, the scientific detail, details, but suffice it to say, it is this system of, like, fluid that runs through the brain and it sort of, um, you know, rinses out um, the bad materials, um, mostly while we're sleeping and it drains it out of our central nervous system. And so that's something that is of interest for preventing these diseases. And what we think happens in this schematic is that in the healthy brain, you know, the system works fine, but in patients who get neurodegenerative diseases, um, the system doesn't work as well. And um, as I said, one way to sort of you know, um, improve the function of the system is to get a good night's sleep. And the other thing studies have shown is exercise, because exercise increases the rate of fluid flow um, through this system. 
So sleep and exercise are, are things that will help your glymphatic system uh, function optimally. Okay, so I just want to end with some therapeutic opportunities on the horizon. Um, we have, and basically review what I just went through. We have identified some small molecules to boost the function of certain key regulatory proteins, and we will be deploying them for use in human patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease and Huntington's disease very soon. There are specific pathways that I told you about, the ubiquitin proteasome system, the autophagy system, that are responsible for the removal of damaged and misfolded proteins. So we are coming up with ways to activate them as a therapy to treat these diseases. And last but not least, we are discovering the instruction manual for how our own brain waste disposal system, the glymphatic system works, and um, we're developing drugs to help it function optimally. Though for now, you know, I've given you some advice so that you can, you know, get that system operating as best as possible, um, you know, yourself. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Manuki. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to follow up on some of the comments that uh, Dr. Lisbada um, so nicely covered. Um, and I'm going to really try to focus on the fluids. Um, and I'm going to start with a definition from the Oxford Dictionary. So a, a substance that has no fixed shape and yields easily to external pressure, a gas or especially a liquid. So for the purposes of my lecture, I'm going to adjust that slightly and talk about fluids that are gases or liquids that transport cells and molecules around the human body, and especially in this case, to the brain. And when we, kind of, when we think about the fluids that are important for the brain and for the transport of all sorts of cells and molecules, there are really three that come to mind. Um, the air we breathe which is a gas, the blood that circulates in our body, which is a liquid. Um, and then the brain has its own fluid, the CSF or the cerebral spinal fluid. Right? And they actually all work together. They form sort of the infrastructure of your body right? to transport all the fuels that you need to burn and to remove all the waste that you need to get rid of, some of the waste that Dr. Lespada talked about. So this is sort of a, a way of conceiving how these three fluid systems work together for this kind of purpose. And I'll take you through the example of sort of fuel, the basic fuels of the body and brain and basic waste. And that really starts with the air, right, which is in sort of this nice symbiotic relationship with the plant kingdom. The plants get rid of oxygen as waste which we use as fuel along with the glucose or the carbohydrates that the plants make that we eat. We take those in through the GI tract or in the case of the air through the lungs, which is the key interface right, between the air and the blood. Then on the fuel side, what the blood adds to the oxygen and glucose that are needed to burn are some key molecules like insulin from the pancreas, which allows all the cells in your body to take up glucose to burn for energy. And then the thyroid hormone, which is produced by the thyroid gland, very aptly named, which regulates how much and how fast you burn that energy. And then, then the cerebral spinal fluid, the brain fluid, what that contributes is the chorae plexus, which is the interface tissue between the blood and the CSF, produces its most abundant product, which is called transthyretin, which basically distributes thyroid hormone to every cell in your brain to be able to regulate how much energy it burns. Okay. And then on the way back, of course, we have to get rid of all that energy we burn. We create a lot of carbon emission. Actually. Actually, 
cellular respiration from animals accounts for about 7% of carbon emissions, but of course, that's a pretty small fraction, and we, we were sort of in equilibrium with the plant kingdom with this. Um, of course, things have changed. But the idea is we, um, through the blood mainly, the CO2 comes back to the lungs, and then we respire CO2 back, and the plants can use that to fix carbon and use that as their fuel and energy. So the, what the CSF does in terms of removing waste are things that Dr. Laspada talked to about, the glymphatic system, um, and the CSF as a whole, this water in the brain, which removes waste products like amyloid beta, the molecule that's associated with Alzheimer's disease, and a whole host of other waste products that are produced because we burn fuel and we're trying to build and maintain the brain. Right? Those get transported to the blood, and then the blood has different ways of getting rid of this waste. Right? So there's A beta and other types of insoluble waste. A lot of that gets taken care of by the liver. And then the more water-soluble waste is taken care of by the kidney and ends up with the last fluid in this infrastructure, which is the urine, which also regulates your body water. Right? So this whole infrastructure network, transportation network, um, basically of fluids. So if we just look at the brain fluid, what does the brain fluid do for the brain? And I summarize that as fuel, clean, cushion, float, and cool. So a, a lot of things that fluids do, all fluids do, but some special things that the CSF does for our brain, right? And, but first, um, a fun fact about the CSF. So your CSF, your, your Cori plexus makes about 500 mils of CSF every day. So it's about two cups. So 500 mils. So your, C your Cori plexus makes about that much CSF every day, which is quite a lot of fluid. Um, it's actually um, about three or four times um, the volume of CSF that you turn over every day. So every six to eight hours, you have actually brand new CSF in your brain, right? So it's quite a lot of fluid. And of course, I covered a couple of ways that the CSF fuels and cleans um, by allowing thyroid hormone to get distributed to the brain, by removing all of this waste just from the flow of CSF. Um, in addition, the, the CSF is really important for cushioning the brain, because the brain is kind of soft, yeah, I brought a model of the brain, too, here, just in case anybody... Oh, it fell apart. Thankfully, it's... Yeah, that, and that's what's a one-handed trying to grab a brain with a microphone in your hand. Okay, anyway. At any rate... Um, uh, no, 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 that's okay, right? I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, the, the brain's kind of soft, and you can't really change the volume of the brain, and it's inside this kind of hard skull right, which is important to protect it. But at the same time, you can't, you can't stand a lot of changes in the pressure inside, otherwise your brain will blow up, right? So th the CSF and the blood have to work together to help control the volume, and the cushioning of the CSF is super important for that, right? And then, literally, your brain, brain floats in the CSF. So it reduces the effective weight of this brain, which I could show you roughly how big it is in my hand. Um, it's about 1,500 grams normally, but its effective weight, because of the buoyancy, is about 50 grams. So it reduces the effective weight of the brain about 30-fold, which helps the brain a lot in terms of making it easier for the brain to do its work. And then the last point, which is the part I'm gonna dive into a little bit deeper, is the cooling part of the CSF, okay? Um, and the importance of the CSF and actually all the other fluids I talked about in cooling the brain. And we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more. Okay, so there's this infrastructure of fluid. The CSF does a lot of things for the brain on its own. Why is it that the brain actually even has its own fluid system? There's not any really any other organ in our body that
that has its own circulatory system quite like the CSF. So why, why is that? And that has to do with the fact, and, and Al referred to this, the human brain is a very special organ, but it's also a very needy organ for the same reason. And part of the reason is the CSF is mostly water, and there's some very special superpowers that water have, right? Um, and so, first off, I think it's important to remember how important water is to just life as we know it on Earth. You may all recall that we originated, and life originated on Earth in water before emerging on land and air. Um, and in fact, it's so hard to imagine life without water that everywhere that NASA and JPR are looking for life is where there used to be liquid water, right? So this is Jezero Crater on Mars where the Perseverance rover is right now, taking samples. Um, you all might remember too that we, each of us, really started in an ocean, right? In the amniotic fluid in our mother's womb. And then even after birth, we're mostly water, right? So 70% of us is, is water. Over two-thirds of us is water, right? So there's obviously something really special about water. And one of those superpowers is it is really remarkable about how well it keeps things cool. And this is really important. And th this is probably something we can all kind of relate to, burning our feet on the sand in a hot summer day. We probably don't, probably didn't spend too much time thinking about well, why is it that the sand, which is a solid, gets so hot? And why is it that the ocean stays so cool? Part of it is it's a fluid, so it can mix, so it can dissipate heat, right? But the other thing is that water is the best fluid you can imagine for absorbing heat. It has the highest heat capacity of any natural liquid. And obviously this is something that's super important for fish or any creature that lives in the ocean or in fresh water. It's super important for the brain for reasons that Dr. Laspada talked about because it is an absolute energy hog. It is a gas guzzler like you can never believe, right? So it, it's obviously, you know, widely regarded as the most complex structure in the universe. But because of that, it burns a tremendous amount of energy and really generates a tremendous amount of heat. So the brain represents about 2% of our body weight, but burns about 25% of our energy. And if you talk about a newborn baby, it's more like 60%. Um, so it really is a tremendous energy hog, and most of the energy actually from burning glucose and oxygen is released as heat. So we really need ways to cool the brain because we're warm-blooded, we have to keep things at a constant temperature, right? So as it turns out, the CSF alone really can't do that. Uh, this whole fluid infrastructure really has to work together to cool the brain. Okay. Part of that is by flow, but a lot of it is by just, again, mixing, sort of like the ocean, the way that you can mix mix the CSF to kind of dissipate the heat. The way that, um, oh, I see the, there's a little bit of a formatting issue. But at any rate, um, the way that we probably think most about that the way this fluid infrastructure collaborates to cool the body is between the air and the blood, and that's by sweating, right? So that's the heat in the blood comes to the skin, and then that contacts with the air, and then the evaporation of water helps to cool the body and the brain secondarily. There's a lot of different ways the CSF and the blood actually interact to help cool the brain, right? One of them is just the way that the heartbeat works, 
So every time the heart contracts, the quarry plexus squirts out a little bit of CSF. So it produces, with every heart contraction, there's a little bit more CSF produced. And with every heart relaxation, there's actually upward movement of the CSF back towards the head to promote this mixing in heat dissipation. Okay. And there's actually a, a lot of other ways the CSF and blood interact to help cool the brain. Um, on the flip side, there's actually also a lot of ways that the air and the CSF interact and cooperate to cool the brain. So one of them is just breathing through your nose. So let's take a moment. Okay, okay. deep breath. Hold it for a cup or a second too. And breathe out. So you've just cooled your brain in a couple of different ways. Every time you breathe in through your nose, if you look at the back of the nasal cavity, it's really quite close to the base of the brain. Every time you breathe in, you actually activate that local circuit, brain circuit in that region that's involved in cooling the brain, the hypothalamus being a very important part of that, right? In addition, it turns out that you actually cool the brain by breathing. And there's some recent studies on yawning. Why do people, and they actually study this in rats, what, why people and in, in, in rats yawn, and it wasn't because they were tired or felt bored, although I have no idea how you measure boredom in a rat, but what they could detect was that the temperature in your brain goes up a little bit before you yawn, and after you yawn, your brain temperature goes down. And so the current thought now is that we yawn as a cooling mechanism for the brain, okay? Then the other way that the air and the CSF interact to cool your brain is just this process of deep breathing and, and breathing. So you can do it with me one more time. Really take a deep breath, ready? So every time you inhale and your diaphragm lowers, creates that negative pressure in your chest so your lungs can expand, there's also this really quite massive upward movement of CSF back towards your head. Kind of a lot, much larger magnitude than the cardiac effect, the heart effect, the breathing effect. So there is this constant mixing of your CSF up and down every time you breathe, which is the way that sort of your breathing, the air and CSF collaborate to keep your brain cool. Okay. So this infrastructure, water is really special. There's a lot of things that are involved in cooling. The bummer is, as we age, it's like a state of drought um, for the body and brain. And you know, if you kind of look at some of the data from the National Council of Aging, so younger people, the body with water content's about 70%. In older adults, it's often in the range of 50 to 55%. And if you look at this table from the National Council of Aging, that means normal aging is a state of severe dehydration. About 40% of older adults are considered to be chronically dehydrated. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one of them is a diminished sensation, for a thirst sensation, diminished appetite. Many um, have to take medications that tend to dehydrate the body. Another aspect is this idea uh, that with aging, you produce less CSF. And so if you produce less CSF, you're going to get less of all those good things that it does. Less of the fueling, less of the cleaning, less of the cooling of the brain as you age. And, and obviously those things will have negative impacts on the brain and some of these symptoms that are listed here. So now one of the things my lab's studying is thinking about this aging effect from the perspective of the quarry plexus, this tissue that makes the CSF. And one of the things that we're finding, both by studying human tissues as well as 
developing stem cell models is that there are a lot of signs of very early sort of accelerated aging in the choroid plexus. So this is a picture of a microscopic image of the choroid plexus from a 55-year-old man. Um, and you can see in blue are all the, are the cells of the choroid plexus, and in green are these age-related aggregates. Similar to the aggregates that Dr. Laspada talked about, these protein aggregates in these different neurodegenerative diseases, this one's still a mystery. We don't know what the protein is, but we're working on that. This is one of many um, aging-related effects that increases really dramatically in midlife, particularly between 40 and 60. And then if you look at this along with where the water channel is, which is responsible for producing the CSF, you can see there's really a dramatic reduction of the water channel and the ability of the choroid plexus to produce water where they have these aggregates. So obviously one of the things we're trying to work out is how these early accelerated aging related changes contribute to the, the loss of brain fluid. Um, and ultimately if we can slow that down or reverse that, we can have maintain a more youthful fluid state for our brain as we get older. So that's gonna take a while but I think the good news is I actually talked about a ton of different things already that we all can do that really help our fluid, our brain fluid, to either produce more fluid or to move it around, right, to, to have a healthier brain. So one of them, deep breathing meditation, just directly cooling your brain, mixing mixing that CSF as you take that deep breath. Exercise, so the increased heart rate, breathing rate, blood flow, that both produce more CSF and also contribute to the mixing. Stretching, so, so there's a few like pockets where CSF tends to stagnate a little bit. So the, like the bottom of your spinal cord. So it's, you know, you can just stretch like that. Get that moving a little bit. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I won't do that again. Um, the, other th the other place it tends to stagnate is like in the back of your neck. There's a big pocket here, so just down that. Okay, so I feel better already. <laughs> sleep. So Al talked about sleep already in that lymphatic system and how that helps to really remove waste. That's super important. But even if it's not sleep, just lying down, right? You're letting gravity, in a sense, shift the fluid towards your head. Hydrate the brain, mix it up, keep things cool. Apparently, Truman Capote, who is a famous author, um, um, called himself... Um, a totally horizontal author. He couldn't think or write unless he was lying on the couch. Um, so I wonder if he was really chronically dehydrated. Um, and then, sort of, caffeine. Okay, so um, sort of, right? Because caffeine is actually well known to increase CSF production. But it's also known to increase urine production <laughs> by the same mechanism. I mean, there's a lot of shared mechanisms between the choroid plexus and the kidney. Well, yeah. So uh, on the one hand, it can be a good boost immediately, but long term, it doesn't help. It 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 tends to be dehydrating. I, I just had some coffee right now too. So anyway, I'm just as bad as anyone else. But probably the number one thing you could do, super simple, very, very cheap, is to drink more water. Just drink more water, right? Um, the National Council of Aging re recommends six to eight cups per day, depending on your body size. Unfortunately, sorry, coffee, tea, and alcohol don't count in that total because they tend to be dehydrating as, as well, okay? 
Water chaser's good. So with my coffee, I have a water chaser. <laughs> That's exactly right. So I'll leave you with um, this quote from a magazine I read on Saturday, my latest MIT technology review. They had an, an article in aging. And this professor in the Columbia School of Public Health said, if we want to slow aging, then it would be good if we all got to drink clean water and breathe clean air. That's a first step where we could actually make a lot of progress. And I couldn't agree more. And so with that, thank you and drink up. Okay, those were two really terrific presentations. Thank you so much. It takes, for those of you who don't know, a lot of time to prepare an engaging presentation that is you know, directed so that everybody can participate and understand. So thank you guys very much. Um, I'll invite both of you up to the front for questions. For those of you who are online in the audience, I think we have about 80 participants, something in that ballpark online. Please feel free to put any questions that you have into the Q&A box, and we will be monitoring those um, to relay your questions to Drs. Manuki and Laspada. Um, in the meantime, can I invite anyone in the audience who has a question to start us off? One second. I saw a hand back here. Could you explain a little more about turning over proteins? I wasn't real clear about what that means. Yeah, it just means to sort of break them down into their component parts. So we make proteins, all different types of proteins, structural proteins, enzymes, we use them. And as we use them, they get damaged and beaten up. So then we direct them to certain, you know, um, places in the cell, you know, like what I call the cellular garbage disposal, where the proteins get degraded into their component amino acids. So that's what I mean is the is the breakdown of the protein into its component parts so that then you can make new proteins. That's turnover because you have a protein, then you have the component parts, then you make a new protein. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, okay I'm gonna actually grab one from online so we can alternate back and forth a little bit. I think, uh, actually, either of you could field this, so I'll let you fight it out. Um, thanks for two wonderful presentations with useful guidance. How much of a part does genetics play versus the environment in terms of, I'm going to broaden this, the specific question is about Alzheimer's disease, but let's just say neurodegenerative disease. Okay. You want, um, Why don't you take it? Up? I guess I'm, I'm a board certified clinical geneticist, yes, so I guess are. I should take it. I'm uh. pretty sure that goes to you. That's true. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is a great question. And so um, it turns out for these neurodegenerative diseases that in about 10% of cases, they strictly run in families, whether you're talking about ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, or Alzheimer's disease, or Parkinson's disease. So there, one of your parents had the disease, and you're at risk of inheriting a single genetic mutation that gives you the disease. But as I said, that's only 10%. So the rest, the, the other 90% we call sporadic, and we believe that it is a combination of genetics and environment. And, um, you know, it's sort of a continuum. So at one end, there may be a more of a genetic, um, you know, contribution. For example, people may have heard of um, APOE. And so... APOE comes in three forms, APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. And it's known that individuals who carry the APOE4 genotype are at greatly increased risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. But it's not a foregone conclusion that they will get it. Okay. Um, and then for other patients, we believe that environment was more important. We think that there are things like head trauma and other things that probably predisposed to getting neurodegenerative diseases. So the answer is that it is a combination. And, um, you know, uh, and we also talked about some things tonight, uh, you know, stress, not sleeping properly, being dehydrated. Um, so we think that um, for most patients who get Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, it's a combination of genetics and environment. 
For some people, it will be more genetics. For other people, it will be more environment. And we don't yet know how to tell that apart, but that's something that we're working on. Um, now I understand why nose breathing is so much better than mouth breathing, so thanks for that. But what are some of the <laughs> bad things that are happening when the brain's getting hot, and what are some of the good things that are happening when it's staying cool? Yeah, so uh, great question. So some of the bad things, um, um, I, I think it's a, it can be a little bit nonspecific. Um, so there are kind of more modern ways. Um, part of the reason we don't know too much about brain temperature is that it used to take actually having an open craniotomy and being able to measure. But now that there are radiographic ways to do so-called brain thermometry, I think we're starting to see a lot more studies on brain te temperature. Um, it, it is known that in, in certain disease states, um, degenerative diseases, that the brain's hotter. Um, it, it's also known that probably one of the most consistently therapeutic approaches for, say, traumatic brain injury or other forms of brain injury is hypothermia to reduce. That's probably one of the most consistently uh, helpful therapies for brain injury. Um, and, and there are a lot of kind of disease-specific ideas about sort of how, how brain temperature works and how that can come into sort of play and sort of thinking about a therapeutic approach. So hopefully that answers your question. So I'm going to jump to one online really quick because actually I think it's an interesting question and it, it touches to, to both of you. And that is, um, is there, uh, how can I ask it? So is there evidence to suggest that quality of sleep is going to influence your developments of neurodegenerative disease. And I know, Al, you'll probably want to chime in from a genetic point of view in terms of that. But let's start with you, Ed, and then go to Al. That the quality of quality the sleep. Of sleep. So yeah. could you track, like, for example, risk of developing neurodege neurodegenerative disease by s sleep quality in a population? Um, and, and there are correlative studies already uh, about <laughs> yeah, so the, and the correlation studies are not often with teenagers, right? They're not that far out ahead. But if you kind of look at um, quality of sleep of individuals who are diagnosed, for example, with Alzheimer's disease versus those that aren't, um, sleep quality often comes out as being sin significantly worse. For, so um, it is definitely thought to be a, a risk factor. Um, but yeah, sort of in that prospective way and thinking about, well, um, how much do you want you encourage your teenagers to be sleeping and thinking about sleep? I, I think it's it it all stands to reason. Part of it too is although the diagnosis of these neurodegenerative conditions comes when you're an older adult, it is years and decades of building up these abnormal proteins. Um, and really for some, in some cases, for example, like with APOE and its role, um, you know, it's starting from birth or even, so anything you do. And that sort of accumulation Accumulation of trash, right? of trash exactly. So just doing a better job of removing your trash early. Yeah. So to the correlation point, of course, I'm thinking of fatal familial insomnia. insomnia. Yeah. And so I, I wondered if you, yeah, that's really rare, but that's something that um, you know uh, is uh, is fascinating. Yeah. But in terms of just more generally speaking, yeah, there's really good evidence that um, impaired sleep quality promotes the progression of neurodegenerative diseases. In fact, um, I have um, colleagues at Merck who are working on drugs to improve sleep quality, and you know, with the idea that they will deploy these drugs as treatments for. Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Now, when you think about Parkinson's disease, it's interesting because uh, many patients before they develop Parkinson's disease have what is called REM sleep disorder, where their sleep is broken up and they don't get that sort of, you know, rapid eye movement sleep that is, you know, the high quality sleep that we need. And then, of course, they develop this neurodegenerative disease and then they can't sleep properly and that makes the disease progress. It becomes a positive reinforcing cycle um, where things get worse and worse. So sleep quality is definitely very important in um, you know, neurodegenerative disease progression and 
you know, improving or retaining sleep quality, it, we believe is an effective treatment for these disorders, actually. Awesome. One question back here. Uh, yes, I have, I have two questions. One is a question I can get afterwards. But uh, the one question I wanted to ask you is um, you said misfolded uh, proteins are the cause of all diseases. And then you're degenerative. Yeah. Degenerative. Okay. And then you said prions are uh, misfolded proteins. So what I'm wondering is, is are, are prions the cause of diseases if they are misfolded proteins? Are they the cause of diseases or the cause of some diseases? Yes. Could they be? Um, and would they be the would they be um, the main cause of all diseases since they are misfolded proteins? Yes. And if they are, okay. um, why don't they just go after prions yeah. and, and just focus on prions right. as a field of study to, to cure all diseases? So the prion protein itself is the cause of one category of neurodegenerative disease the so-called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or mad cow disease, which occurred, you know, back um, in, the, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s in England. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there's many different misfolded proteins that cause neurodegenerative diseases. Prions are just one of them. However, I should say that um, when we discuss um, neurodegenerative um, disease-causing proteins, we often call them prion-like. So we consider the prion protein like the granddaddy of all the misfolded proteins, and it's the one that we've learned the most from in terms of understanding the pathobiology. And in fact, uh, Dr. Stanley Prusner, who did this work some years ago, got a, a Nobel Prize um, for his studies of the prion protein. But the prion protein is just, you know, one um, causes just one category of disease. It turns out, fortunately, to be a rare category. Okay. There's, for anyone who's interested in prions, there's actually an awesome book called Deadly Feasts that's probably 15 years old at, at this point, but it's a really easy read and it's super interesting about the story of how it's prion terrifying. diseases were that's recognized true. and you might never eat meat again. Yes. Um, <laughs> Which is probably a good thing. But <laughs> so so um, following that up, just because it's a natural translation, and I, I apologize to people on Zoom if we don't get all of your questions asked, but um, there's a question that dovetails off of this, and that's whether there, is it possible to accumulate misfolded proteins in some people and not have disease? And do we know that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so um, the way I can answer that question is to um, reference the work of one of my colleagues here in the Department of Neurology at UC Irvine, Claudia Kawas. She's leading this study at the Laguna Woods Village where we're following people we're in their 80s and 90s, and um, you know we're, we're testing them to see how their cognitive function is. And all these people in this study have agreed that when they pass, that we can you know autopsy them and look at their brains. Now it turns out um, one third of individuals who are cognitively intact up until the day they die, they're perfectly fine. When we look in their brains. Um, the neuropathologist would say they have Alzheimer's disease because they have amyloid plaques and neurofibrillate tangles of tau. So, it, it, so what we think is going on in those individuals is there's some resilience factor where um, the body, the brain, has come up with a way to sort of neutralize um, the negative effects of those misfolded proteins. And that's something that we're still trying to understand. So, but the answer to the question is yes. Some people accumulate misfolded proteins and hold them at bay and don't develop disease, but other people do not, and we don't fully understand, you know, why that is. Okay, we have one more over here. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, you were talking about the quality of sleep. So, is it, uh, you know, my Fitbit watch gives me a deep sleep and uh, you know the REM so uh, and, and sometimes it's confusing because it looks like I don't have any deep sleep and I still get a high score with just the REM so is the REM more important my understanding is that the REM is more important is that your um, so I'm not I can't recall exactly that glymphatic studies especially with the sleep I think deep sleep actually 
was the period when that cleansing of the brain was sort of the greatest, was in deep sleep. Yeah. Um, and I think there's something about the cycling, right? Uh, right, that's important. Yeah, the way you go. yeah. but I, I don't, I, I'm not 100% sure. Right. Yeah. And, um, yep. and, and I, don't... I think the fatal familial insomnia would dovetail to that because there's one stage of sleep, I don't remember what it is, that you never hit. It's not that you oh. never sleep. It's that you never hit, hit, I don't remember, stage, stage three yeah, or stage four. Right, right. And it is lethal, right. in fact. So, yeah. so that's right. So, but um, yeah, so, but anyway, but I'm not enough of a sleep expert to, to answer your question with total definitive confidence. Uh, you know, yeah. So, we should have uh, maybe a community lecture just on sleep at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, chair's prerogative, we call that. And then um, I'll invite maybe one more question from the audience to, to close. And that is uh, dovetailing off of a question um, from the audience. Can you bring us back full circle in terms of, because you are standing in Stem Cell Research Center, um, to how this all connects? And Ed, I'm going to start with you and then um, ask Al to comment. Because the question is, do all the things that we talked about here tonight as positive exercise and ways to get your CSF sloshing around and, mm -hmm. and so on, do they affect neurogenesis? Do they and, affect neurogenesis? Yeah. Um, so is it not just clearance of debris, but uh -huh. do those same sorts of, you know, activity-driven right. or other things that you might okay. do, deep breathing, by increasing fluid circulation, does that have an impact on how you're replacing your, your neurons uh -huh. or how proliferative your stem cell population okay. is, for example? Okay. Well, so my, my, basically my answer to that is no. Um, so... Okay, but here's the reason, right? Neurogenesis in the human brain is very paltry. And over evolutionary time, it's gotten more and more paltry. It's still kind of controversial. I think it's clear you can get neurogenesis in the hippocampus as a young person. But in adults, it's very, very controversial. I whether could you get not it. disagree more. So, sorry, okay, we no, just but get see, to have a little no, fight now. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's, because there's, you can, you can cite... A, a ton of papers on both sides, so I think that's no. Why. But you can only cite two that are actually properly done. Okay, well that, that, could, that, that robust that could, neurogenesis. Okay, so, so let me let me the the other the other reason this is, is fact. right. So <laughs> for neocortex, which is the biggest part, about eighty percent of brain volume, if includes subcortical white matter, that's the part that's expanded the most, and that's the part for which it's the clearest that there really isn't significant neurogenesis after birth, right? Um, and there's probably reasons for that, right? It's probably adaptive to not keep on swapping out neurons that encode information for memory. That's probably that we've evolved to favor memory over redoing circuits and and just having to do you know short-term stuff all the time. But there so, is neurogenesis in the adult human brain that would affect brainstem functions that would affect all of the yeah. regulatory processes so you're talking I, I about. I think it's possible, um, and it could, but I'm just saying over evolutionary time, it's like it's getting less and less. So it could be that this is all, this could be related, and of course, it could be the better brain health you have, the more neurogenesis you have. I'm just saying, thinking about it phylogenetically, th th it, this is not the way our brains are evolving. So phylogenetically, right. for the lay audience here, means that going from you know animals that don't have a cortex that's wrinkled, for example, or from you know all the way back to uh, early mammals, that we'll just stay within the mammalian systems, on on up to humans that have really complex, big brains with lots of wrinkles and lots more structure to work with. Do you want to chime in on where do stem cells come into the game? Yeah, so I guess the way I think about it is that, yeah, there is a capacity to generate new neurons from stem cells in the brain, but it's not so much to sort of rewire the brain and create new circuits, but it's to permit those neurons to support the existing circuits and neurons that are in the brain by producing growth factors, um, by basically providing you know, support for the, for the damaged or aging brain so that it can maintain, you know, optimal function. So that's the way I guess I've, I've thought about it. And, and I think that that is something yeah. where, at least 
my former, well, I guess he's still a friend, but former colleague, um, Rusty Gage at the Salk, you know, has done a lot of, I think, really compelling work uh, along those lines to support that, that sort of model. Yeah. Do you want to talk about, no, we're good. <laughs> Any other last questions from the audience? Das, do you want to shout it out? Can you I do, oh yeah, so Das's question is for medications that where that decrease your heart rate. Yeah. Um, is it known whether um, CSF production decreases? So I I don't know if that's the case or not. That can be a little bit complicated too because sometimes decreasing heart rate increasing increases the strength of the individual contractions, and so that could it could be complicated. But I I don't actually know if people have done that study. So in respect for your time and our audience here, I'm going to call the questions here. I will say um, you guys drove a ton of questions. There's 20 online that we have not answered. Um, I mentioned before, so <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't tell you guys this in advance. In the, in the heyday, as I, I talked about here, we would often not close these lectures until about 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Because when people are here and asking questions, we sadly for you, would go through all 20 of those <laughs> before anyone left. And um, these could get to be really long evenings. But it, it's a lot of fun. And there's some great questions that we're going to miss. So I apologize to our online audience. But I thank everyone for attending today. And thank you guys very much for some really outstanding presentations. So.